a friend of the eyewitness to this crazy police shooting that happened today in Beckley, West Virginia, sent me the footage captured via smartphone while bystanders stuck in traffic watched it go down right in front of them. I already posted it on my Twitter page where it's spreading quickly and obviously disturbing most people. I didn't want to get in trouble again on YouTube, so I'm going to have an edited version here and you can follow the link to my other page, thecivilrightslawyer.com, to watch the entire thing again so I don't get in trouble because I'm going to have some edu educational content on here right now on what the law is after watching this video. So take a look at it. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Apparently, there was a pursuit involving an unidentified subject who is very clearly armed with what appears to be a handgun, and he's pointing it at his own head. As he walks quickly away from a small army of police officers pursuing him, he walks onto the public road with bystanders and stop traffic watching. It appears that the officers are ordering him repeatedly to drop the gun. It's also obvious that he's in a bad place mentally and threatening suicide, or perhaps seeking suicide by cop. Eventually, one or more officers start shooting the man. He drops to the ground. Also dropping to the ground is the man's handgun, which thereafter can be seen on the video out of the man's reach, below where his feet are lying. What's really disturbing here is that the police officer's guns continue to fire, and visibly continue to impact the limp, an incapacitated man who's lying motionless on the ground. The video then cuts off after a barrage of gunshots. It's unknown to me whether there were any additional shots after that camera cut out. I count at least six police officers in the immediate vicinity who could have been shooters, with more following behind them just as the time the first shots ring out. I tried to count the number of shots actually fired, but... Pretty much, it seems impossible to me. But it looks like the first two shots incapacitated the man, and then the large majority of them all came afterwards as he's lying on the ground. In the video, you can see that the officers who were firing can obviously see the handgun on the ground because some of the rounds are hitting the asphalt all around where the gun is located. Perhaps they were shooting at the gun. But they keep shooting at the man as his body rolls over, prone, with rounds hitting the asphalt all around him, also impacting his body, apparently his legs. I don't think there's much of an issue about the first shots that are fired. The case law is pretty clear that cops can shoot a suspect who's armed with a handgun, so long as he's objectively viewed as an imminent threat. And I'm going to have these citations on my website if you click the link at thecivilrightslawyer.com. An officer may use deadly force when the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses a threat of serious physical harm, either to the officer or to others, which could include people sitting in traffic. That's Tennessee versus Garner, 1985. It's all Supreme Court here. I look closely at the video and I can't quite tell which hand on the subject is holding the handgun at the time the first couple of shots are fired. It looks to be probably in his right hand. And it's also a close call whether the right hand, which is possibly holding the gun or arguably holding the gun, whether it rises towards the officer or officers before or after the first shot is fired. But it does appear to me, looking at it in slow motion, that it's, the right hand does start to come up. 
However, the Fourth Amendment still prohibits law enforcement officers from using excessive or unreasonable force in the course of making an arrest or otherwise seizing a person, which includes shooting them. Graham v. Connor, 1989. The courts determine whether the amount of force used by police is reasonable based on an objective standard. Looking at the circumstances confronting the officer immediately prior to and at the very moment that he or they fired the weapon. Now we're in the Fourth Circuit where this happened, so I'm citing Fourth Circuit case law now. That's Green Ridge, Green Ridge versus Ruffin, 1991. Moreover, this is assessed by the courts specifically as of, quote, the moment that force is employed. So when the trigger is pulled. Waterman versus Batten, also Fourth Circuit, 2005. So this took place, again, in the Fourth Circuit, which has previously held that the number of shots fired by police in general in, in itself is not alone dispositive, if there are other facts present that indicate reasonableness. You can look at Elliott versus Levitt, Fourth Circuit, 1996, for that. The Fourth Circuit has held a couple of times that, quote, force justified at the beginning of an encounter is not justified even seconds later, if the justification for the initial force has been eliminated. See Brockington versus Boykins, 4th Circuit, 2011. So, even if the first couple of shots, because the guy was holding the handgun, are justified, or may be seen as justified, that can change if the guy drops the gun if he's incapacitated, if he's seized in some way, then an officer may not necessarily be justified seconds after a justified shoot. For instance, a coup de grace, or perhaps a situation like this, where one officer starts firing and the rest of them just continue to fire. An officer will not be entitled to qualified immunity for engaging in a use of force that is, quote, unnecessary, gratuitous, and disproportionate force to seize a secured, unarmed citizen. That's a state versus city of Martinsburg, 4th Circuit, 2020. Again, these will be on the post at thecivilrightslawyer.com. So looking at this video, although the subject appears to have been armed at the time of the first shots, the video very clearly shows that he was not armed for the majority of the shots. Thus, the courts could treat all the subsequent shots, or many of the subsequent shots, as shooting an unarmed person. Of course, there could be additional facts of which we're unaware, such as information indicating to the shooting officers that there was a second firearm present. We don't know yet. And you know, I wonder if any of these officers who were involved in the shooting today, or who provided, whether they provided statements or interviews immediately following this incident. While it was, you know, still fresh in their minds. Or will they be given the opportunity to sleep on it? To review video footage? To speak with their union reps? Or to seek legal counsel? And to submit a written statement at a later time? After they've had time to really, you know, think about it and consider it. And, you know, whatever the answer is to that, remember, we peasants should be entitled to the very same protections if we're ever involved in a shooting.